I just got out of Casey's Bistro Sports Bar, I think that's what it's called. Anyways, Casey's in West Plains, Missouri. Just played the gig. This is part two. This is the follow-up. So I thought I'd do a follow-up. I just did this whole episode on my way here, and I was like, why not do one on my way back? I'm driving back to Nashville tonight. So I'm pulling an all-nighter, or I'm going to drive till I'm sleepy. So, man, what a night. First of all, it's it's a crazy contrast to be playing an atmosphere like that where everybody's just hollering and drinking and singing the songs back and just having a good time and it's just loud and when you're done singing then all of a sudden they crank up this music and so you're like I'm trying to get my guitar and all my stuff together and it's just like bumping music and you know that's pretty common for Saturday night at places you play well man tonight they did that so then you get out you get in the car and you throw your guitar in there and say goodbye to people and you're shaking hands and hugging people and and then you get in the car and you shut the door and it's just like quiet and I don't want to even turn on the radio because I don't want to hear music (laughs) no not after tonight but I had a blast it was amazing so it was everything I imagined and more um you know, on my way there, I kept saying, I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what it is. I got no idea, and I didn't. And when I got there, I had this concern because this was kind of being pitched as a songwriter night. Well, you're looking around. It's like there's probably 250 people in this place, and everybody is loud, and they're eating chicken fingers and quesadillas and burgers and BLTs and they're drinking and and there's a bar and then there's tables and people are eating and they're just carrying on loudly and there's pool tables and I'm like I've never in my life seen a successful songwriter night in this kind of atmosphere so I was fascinated to see is this room going to get quiet people want to emulate the Nashville songwriter round experience I've seen this over the years, people try to emulate it, and it, it's unique because it, it started, the whole concept started at Bluebird Cafe, just a, a little history lesson here, in Nashville in 19, I think it was 1987, a little place called Bluebird Cafe opened, maybe it was 86, somewhere in there, and at the time, it was the first music venue of its type where only songwriters can play, not cover bands, not just dudes with guitars singing whatever. It's You have to be playing original music, your original music, and it, we don't care if you can actually sing or not, but if you can write and play it to a melody and, and sing it, sing a melody with your song you wrote, then come here and play. And right away they were getting the top songwriters in town because they found a home on a stage where people came to listen and Bluebird Cafe's motto is and I remember the first time I went there I saw on the table every table had that motto written on it it's like on a piece of paper the concept is hey we're here to, to listen to the original songs the songwriters sing and they're not crappy songwriters. They're hit makers. And they're up and coming people. They're legit. So Bluebird, they also had a, had a process where they picked out who they wanted to sing there. You couldn't just walk in off the street and start singing your songs. You had to either know somebody or go through an audition. So this made it very unique and special. And really fast, it started attracting people like garth brooks who moved to town and garth actually was sitting in the audience when a guy named tony arada was up there singing the dance and garth said if i ever get a record deal i'm going to record that song and tony thought yeah you and everybody else in town you know blah blah whatever another guy with a cowboy hat tells me that blah blah and 
course, Garth stayed true to his word and put out the dance. But he heard it there. And Garth was discovered. I can't remember who it was that discovered him, but whoever did, the the moment for Garth came when he played the Bluebird Cafe and sang If Tomorrow Never Comes. And when he did that, he caught the eye of some bigwig. I think it might have been at Capitol Records. And they gave him a record deal. So that concept has... It, it just took off from there. And in the late 90s, I was about... 15 years old when I first ran across the TV show Live at Bluebird Cafe. It was on, I think, like Turner South Network at the time. And I, it was on cable. My my grandparents had cable. So I'm watching this, this incredible concept. There's four songwriters and it's called In the Round, and what they're doing is they're all staring at each other. Their, their chairs are turned towards each other, and everybody's sitting around them. And it reminded me of Elvis in the 1968 special when him and his band did that. They all sat around, and they looked at each other, and he wore the black le- leather suit and sang all his old hits in a very stripped-down arrangement, musical arrangement setting. And it was unbelievable. So that, that kind of thing had been done with big stars, but now there's these songwriters I've never heard of on TV, and I'm watching them. And I remember thinking, I want to see Bluebird one day. Years later, I moved to Nashville, and I, the, one of the first things I did is I went down to Bluebird. And on Monday nights, you could do the open mic. And it was so crowded on Monday night that I had to get a, a stamp or not a stamp, it was some kind of like a sticker thing. Whatever it was, it was like, you signed up for tonight, but we had so many people, we couldn't get to you, so now you're on next Monday. So I had to come back the next Monday <laughs> to sing my one song at Bluebird. And my song sucked. I don't remember what it was. I think I had a song back then called I'm Jesus, and it was a song from the perspective of Jesus. What a, I, The audacity to do that is ridiculous. Um, Hey, I need to check my map because I'm driving in the Ozarks and I don't know where I'm going. All right, I'm back. I stopped for fuel fill up there. Pulling out of the gas station now. Check the map. Oh, my gosh. This is what happens when you put music gear in your passenger seat in my Corolla. It yells at me. Put your seatbelt on. It thinks there's a person there. So I just put a seatbelt on my bag of music gear. Alrighty, so you're just riding along here with me on the cusp, off the cuff, actually totally off the cuff because what I was on the cusp of is over. So, alright, back to Bluebird. Anyway, I was trying to, to set up the fact that what we did tonight it's, it's these places and restaurants and bars that are now trying to replicate that concept of four songwriters playing songs. And when I moved to Nashville, it was something I wanted to be a part of. So this is one of my favorite types of shows. Three or four songwriters next to each other. And it, it seems like it, there's always a variety if you get the right people in the mix and, and just everybody's just a little different. So you got a variety, audiences, don't get bored, make it two hours long. And and then the real intriguing part of tonight for me was we're in this bar and I'm thinking if we interact with the audience and if we have covers mixed in as well, it seems like this could be pretty cool, especially since the guys that are singing some originals, two of them have number one hits. So people are going to know their songs. So to me, I just wanted to get up there and figure out where where am I at as far as like what's my job here. Let me fill out the vibe of the room. And right away, I realized, okay, so it, it was... It was a lineup that started with Jacob Hackworth. He played a really cool song he wrote, starting off the round. This bar, as soon as we started, some of the people got quiet, but it was still kind of loud out there. 
there's a lot of racket. There's a lot of people playing pool, having drinks, talking, commu- you know, conversations. So it sounds like you're playing a bar, and there he's playing an original song, and it's not like the Bluebird shh policy. And one of the people there had told me they were hoping this would be a Bluebird-like experience. And I, nothing against the place. It's an amazing place, but I had my doubts because the people, they're not, they're not here to be shh, quiet. They're not here to be quiet. They're here to have a good time. So Jacob does a song that he wrote, and then Luke does a song he wrote, and then Jackson does a song that he wrote. And all three of these are great songs, but not many people are responding like they know them because they don't. But people seem happy listening, whatever. And to the rest of the people, their background music. Now it's my turn, and I'm like, I know what to do. Not because I know what to do, just because I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do Mama Fried. So Merle Haggard, Mama Tried, was a big hit. People still like Merle Haggard. So that song, before I sing it, I always say, if any of y'all ever heard of Merle Haggard, and of course, a bunch of rednecks hoop and holler, and they ain't never even heard of me or seen me before, and that's their introduction to me with me asking that question. So now they they go, woo, and then I say, well, that's good. I don't play none of his songs, but I sure am happy to play for his fans. And then usually that gets a laugh. I learned that one day, just, I said that on accident one time, and it worked, and I've been saying it ever since, and then I say, well, actually, Merle had a great song called Mama Tried, but I rewrote it because of a sad thing that happened to me in my childhood, it's a really sad story, it's really hard to sing about, but I'm going to do it for you, Mama Fried, and I jump into the song about Mama Frying My Pig Wilbur which is totally a fabrication. It's a lie. We had a pig named Wilbur, and he lived forever. And he didn't die till I was like 20 years old. So, anyway. And when he died, we did not fry him. I buried him in the barn stall he died in because he was so fat, I couldn't get him out of it. He was laying there dead, and I was pissed because this freaking pig I've had my entire life since I was like eight is now dead and I hadn't moved out so I gotta deal with it so I remember having to sit there and dig a hole in the barn stall and by the time I got him up under there and throwed the dirt on him there was a big old hump in the in the barn stall like just out of the ground a huge freaking Wilbur dirt sticking out so that's what happened well I sang I sing the song Mama Fried and and it kind of broke the ice a little bit, at least for me, like, this is the expectation. I'm going to try to make you laugh and have a good time. That's my job tonight. These guys, they're going to he- be here to make you have a good time, but they're going to play different stuff. They're going to play their originals. And anyway, we just did that. And then it came back around to me again, and I played Boot Scoot and Boogie. And man, that one just got them. And because they like that song. And look, I was cheating, okay? So if if a big hit songwriter plays a song that nobody's ever heard, then I play Boot Scoot and Boogie. I cheated. I I got the cheap like reaction. I got everybody hooting and hollering and singing along with me, but I didn't write it. You know what I'm saying? But I thought that's my job. Because when it comes to these guys that are very talented when it comes back around to them I want them to feel comfortable going into their songs that may be a little bit slower or bring it down just a bit so people are fresh their ears are fresh and ready to hear these original songs and then when it bounces to me I need to be the opposite of what they are musically so that's just my philosophy on stage I try to employ that philosophy which is why I was being I was getting driven crazy in the cast show because we just do one song after another sometimes that the set list to me was like man this is too much of the same 
Like, we got to change things up. I see, I literally would see people falling asleep in the crowd. Every show. It was very common. We used to joke about it as a band. It's like, man, everybody's falling asleep out there. Like, and then you see people leave. And when I was in that show, I thought, man, I can't do nothing about this. And I couldn't really. So it was driving me a little nuts. So tonight, to be able to not have a plan and just do, literally change my mind up until the second I start playing my guitar, that was fun. Man, was it fun. So I ended up playing a song, my my song Plucked. I played it, and it went over good. And uh, now i got to look at the map again. One second. All right, so I'm back. I, I played my chicken song. So here I've played a pig song and chicken song. And when and after I play, Jacob has to sing. And like I said, he's he's a, he's got a lot of great songs. But he was like cracking on me. He's like, man, now that I, this guy's going through the whole farm. He's like, I want to go write a cow song in Nashville and stuff. And it was just we were having a lot of fun up there laughing and. Me and Luke, now, we know each other's material. So every song he's, he's done, I've played with him on it and sang harmony with him on a lot of it and vice versa. So he was he was supporting my songs by singing with me and picking along with me. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Well, we get to the end. And, well, actually, I had realized I had two songs left that were going to be my when it was my turn, you know, it was like, well, I got one turn here and then we're going to go through the round again. It'll come back to me the second time. So I played my new song, Father Time. And I have to tell you, I think it was a mistake. You see, I got tricked into it by my own brain because these guys kept playing all these really deep and cool, powerful songs. And I was like, man, I don't have... I haven't played anything serious or deep or meaningful. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do just one song that's meaningful and my latest song I put on Spotify. So I told everybody, I put the song on out. It's on Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube, and uh, went on a big tour with with Johnny Cash Show and uh, was missing my kids or whatever. Anyway, I told the story and played Father Time. And... Actually, I wrote it before I went on the tour, but I was saying I anticipated my feelings on the tour and wrote the song. So, all that said, I played the song, and it was like, you know, people were quiet, and they listened, and then, you know, a lot of people were talking, and it was just that thing where it's like, you know, I'm trying to fit a square peg into a round hole right now. People are being nice and polite, and... It was, you know, no one's batting a thousand. I didn't feel like I was, I felt like I, I was a swing and a miss on that one. And it's crazy because I love that song. And I think that's one of my better songs that I've put out in my life that I've written. But I wrote it with Robin Collins. But I put it out there and sang it tonight. And it just kind of fell flat in the bar. And I knew it would and I did it anyway. And I was like, I was hoping that maybe it wouldn't, but it did. So anyway, back to Jacob, back to Luke, back to Jackson. Now it's my turn, and it's the end of the show. This is the final song. I'm closing, which is bizarre because we got these hit songs. And the guy, Jackson, before me, plays Kane Brown's massive hit called Thank God. Massive hit. Even I know it almost word for word. And I don't even listen to country radio. And when he finished it, the crowd went wild. Everybody was out there singing it. All the all the girls were looking at him, just grinning. They love this guy, Jackson. He's a good-looking dude. Um, just grooving, man. He's got him a little loop. He kicks that machine. He, he's got a band in a box. He started punching that thing and had a beat. Boom, tch, boom, tch, boom, tch, boom, tch. And he starts playing the guitar with it. And after the beat starts, he's real groovy, you know. He's like, while the beat's going, he's like, wrote this song for Kane Brown. I mean, this guy is so cool. He's oozing cool. I'm sitting there like, it. 
I got to follow this and close this show out. And that's when I remembered, courtesy of the red, white, and blue, Toby Keith. And I looked out and I'm seeing Ozark people from the Missouri, like here in Missouri. And I'm like, that's what I'm doing. So he does his song. It's awesome. Everybody loves it. And now it's my turn. And we've been sitting on stools. And I hate doing gigs where you sit on stools. And so, but I don't want to be the one guy who's like standing up. Like, all right, well, it's my turn. I'm going to show y'all up. I'm going to stand up. But I thought, man, this is the perfect song to do that on. So I said, I want to pay tribute to the late, great, incredible, inspiring Toby Keith. And he's a he's a, a Mount Rushmore guy to me on country music. So I said, I'm going to stand up for this one. I moved my stool out of the way. I said, y'all sing it if you know it. American girls and American guys. I started playing that on the guitar. I sounded better than I do now. Not much, though, probably. Dadgummit. And the whole bar stood up and started singing it. And it just felt like the song to end the night on. And I didn't holler boot in my ass like mama would not want me to do. Or they'll put a boot in your ass. I didn't have to say that. They did it. I said my. I meant to say your. But they hollered it. It is just beautiful. I love it, man. It's so fun to sing that song. And the crowd holler it. Patriotic. Remembering when them daggum, ugh, I just get pissed off thinking about 9-11. I remember watching on TV. I almost said bad words just now about about them terrorists. They anyway, I don't want to take the story down, but I was just it, I remember that moment, and when I'm playing that song, I'm so swelled up with pride for America and. I know the country has been tattered and torn and worn and all kinds of terrible decisions have been made by our government over the years and they've done some stupid things and maybe Iraq was one of them. But I don't even really think about that when I'm playing that song. I think about the the military, the men and women who are over there having to serve and fight and drop bombs and do everything they had to do and get shot at and everything they went through over there in Afghanistan and Iraq because of 9-11 and what it must have meant to them to have Toby Keith fly over there and play the army bases and the military bases and sing that song and them stand there and, and know that they're doing something for a cause I mean I get fired up thinking about just he did that. He went over there and played that for them over and over again. And it's not their fault. The government sent them there, and I don't want any of them to die or anything. Or Obviously, I don't, but I didn't want for any of them to have to go over there. But when I'm singing that song, I'm so grateful for our country and the people in this country that still appreciate the message of that song. Because if you just watch the news, you would think 50% of everybody is not going to like it. Well, I've played it many times in the last 10 years. And I'm telling you, that's that's been the, one of the biggest crowd pleaser songs I've ever played. So, God, God bless Kobe. Uh, gosh, God bless Kobe. God bless Toby Keith. And it's getting late and I'm starting to blab too much, but... Thanks for listening to this. When the song ended, big cheer. Everybody was happy. I was happy and a bunch of hugs. And I felt like I was able to carve out a little niche for myself of what job I needed to do tonight to get through this gig. And then it's going to be totally different the next gig. And that's what I love about this life. Happy to be back in it thankful for oh thankful for friends jake and becky scott 
who drove all the way to the gig tonight. My goodness. They they drove an hour and a half to be there. The, I, I remember them back in North Carolina years ago. They were my first $20 bill 20 years ago at a gig in North Carolina. Burlington, North Carolina. My first gig, it was a coffee shop gig. And Becky came in there with her boyfriend at the time and he walked up Jake did and threw a $20 bill in my tip jar and I could not believe it so 20 years ago and then he tonight him and her were there and we didn't have a tip jar out but they were just incredibly nice and so good to catch up with them and they bought a big stack of CDs from me and they spent way too much money on them so very kind people. I was trying to give them the CDs. Trying to give them away. They wouldn't let me do it. So, all right. What a great night in West Plains, Missouri. I'm in the Ozarks trying to drive home. I'm on a curvy two-lane road. I ain't, there ain't no interstates around here. So, uh, God bless you.